my name is Tom Kunselman. I teach uh, chemistry here at Spring Island University. Got a real treat today, uh, Kirby Runyon, who's studying to get his PhD in planetary science, is that correct? At Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's gonna be talking to us today a little bit about some of the uh, data that's come back from the New Horizons uh, mission that has been sending data back from uh, back from Pluto. And I think Kirby was on the team that uh, was part of some of the first people, or the first people, to see the data coming back, which is really kind of cool. Uh, Kirby took some classes, your, your freshman and sophomore years here mm -hmm. at Spring Arbor University. He's even adjuncted, he's taught some courses here at Spring Arbor. And he was a actually the first co-director uh, at our at our summer science camp. Uh, after working with Kirby for a summer, I was inspired for the next uh, round of camp the following year to do an entire um, science camp focused on uh, the chemistry of the solar system. So uh, we're very pleased to have him here, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. Rachel, do you know if my mic is working for recording? I pressed the button, but we're good? OK, awesome. All right. Um, one great thing about uh, being at Spring Arbor is that it's very easy to share one's Christian faith. And I just wanted to open up with uh, a collective prayer. I'd like all of us to pray together um, uh, to worship God for what he has made. So let's pray. Oh, heavenly Father, who has filled the cosmos with beauty, open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness for the sake of him through whom all things were made, your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Part of the theology of doing science, I think, can be captured in a couple verses. Genesis 131 says that God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And uh, in Romans, Paul reminds us that what may be known about God is plain to people because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So if, if the cosmos is good, let's go explore it. Let's go learn about it. And we'll learn more about our creator in the process. Now, the first, jumping into Pluto stuff now, um, the first question I always get is, and this was true on the plane right here, the girl sitting next to me, is Pluto still a planet? And you can hear the desperation in their voice. They want it to be a planet so bad. And I completely agree with them. Um, back in 2007, the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, voted that Pluto is a dwarf planet, which I'm fine with putting adjectives in front of nouns. Dwarf planet, that's fine. But then they took it a step further and by doing so, shot themselves in the foot by saying that a dwarf planet, an adjective and a noun, is not the noun. A, dwar a dwarf planet is not a planet. Well, that just doesn't make sense. Also, there are astronomers who don't study planets. I'm a, we, I and most of the people on the New Horizons mission exploring Pluto are planetary geologists. We study the landscapes, the rocks, the composition, the minerals of other places in the solar system. And so from a geologist's perspective, kind of a bottom-up perspective as opposed to an astronomer's top-down perspective, if you're round <laughs> and you're smaller than a star, like our sun is a star and you're smaller than that, you're a planet. I don't care what you're orbiting, what's orbiting you, where you are, if you're even orbiting anything, if you've got these basic properties, let's, let's do the Star Trek analogy. Captain Kirk or Captain Picard says, on screen, and there's a round thing on there that's not a star. Everyone on the Enterprise and everyone watching CBS knows that's a planet. Uh. Yes. So by that definition, that, so I would consider that a geological definition of a planet. Um, and if you accept that definition of a planet, then our moon is a planet. It's just a planet that's orbiting us. The large moons of, say, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're round. They've got geology. They've got volcanoes and flows and all kinds of stuff going on. They're planets. And if you take that definition of a planet, I have counted there's at least 109 planets in the solar system. And that big number is OK. It's OK to not have to memorize that. <laughs> there aren't nine planets in the solar system. You're off by 100. There aren't eight planets. Um, and, and so 
I stick out my tongue at the IAU. I don't accept their authority to make this, th this proclamation because they're, they're like a cardiologist telling you there's something wrong with your foot. <laughs> so, all right. So, just wanted to get that out of the way. If you're, if you, Pluto's a planet. So is Pluto's large moon Charon, which is also round. Um, so this is uh, this is a, a, a picture that the Planetary Society, of which I'm a member, um, put together um, of the round things in the solar system that have been visited by spacecraft. There's lots of round things we think further from the sun that are round that we haven't sent spacecraft to. This is only the ones that have been visited by spacecraft. Um, a lot of whether you want to call it a planet or not, these are definitely worlds in their own right, and I would say worthy of study. Now here's every round thing in the entire solar system. This is how you get 109. Now a lot of these little guys down here have been observed telescopically from Earth or from Earth orbit, and these those guys are hanging out way over, way out here in what's called the Kuiper Belt named after the Dutch American astronomer Gerard Kuiper who predicted its existence and his hypothesis was confirmed later by telescopic observations. This is the process of science happening. Um, we have since discovered hundreds of Kuiper belt objects, a lot of which are large enough to be round by self-gravity. Every bit of matter in the cosmos, whether it's a pencil or my computer's power adapter, has some gravitational pull on everything else in the universe. If you get enough things close to each other that have enough gravity, the shape that they want to collapse into that minimizes potential energy is a sphere or a triaxial ellipsoid, but close enough. And so a lot of these small things, these small planets that are round, are orbiting the sun 3 billion miles away and further beyond Neptune in the Kuiper belt. There's dozens of worlds out there. Most of the planets are small little icy balls. Not to say they're boring, but they're small icy balls. So prior to this past July, which was when the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto. It flew past Pluto on July 14th at, I think, 8.49 in the morning. Uh, after a nine and a half year trip over three billion miles, it was 96 seconds early. <laughs> and that gave us our first images of Pluto. Now, this is not from that. This is, these are the best images of Pluto from the Hubble Space Telescope. And all we saw is some blurry blobs and weren't quite sure what to do with that. And on about July 15, when the data started trickling back from the New Horizons spacecraft, um, we got to replace. This is the same view as this. This is the same side of Pluto. Taken from New Horizons, taken from Earth, from the Hubble Space Telescope. This right here, this is on my cover slide. This is taken on an internet meme of its own. This is the heart on Pluto, because it's shaped like a heart. And besides, if something's got a heart on it, how can you not call it a planet? Let's be serious here. Right. So, and you can see the heart right here. So now that we have some, some high resolution views, you can actually go back to your old data and actually start to make some sense of what you're seeing here. And in fact, we have seen some areas of Pluto brighten and darken with time. Looking at old Hubble data, we can still get new Hubble data. Uh, and compare it with what New Horizons saw up close. Um, OK, let's work. So this is just kind of a montage NASA put together of our evolving view of Pluto, oh <laughs> starting from a fuzzy blob a few pixels across, and then as New Horizons barreled on. Uh, this past January is when New Horizons spacecraft, from still several tens of millions of miles out, started its long-term observation of Pluto. And those pictures got more and more pixels across. I remember back in April or so, we were having telecons with the science team. And they say, now don't share this with the public. NASA hasn't released this yet. But these few pixels here are Pluto. And you could see Pluto. You could, we could just barely start to see some, some light and dark areas on Pluto. There's something that looked like a little white W. And that, that turned out to be the edge of the heart. The edge of the heart kind of gives you a W shape. But we were starting to see that in April. But we didn't know what it was yet. Um, of course, Pluto has a monstrously large moon compared to it called Charon. You may have heard it pronounced Char Charon. Both are correct pronunciations. I like Charon just because it sounds cooler. And, uh, and so here's Pluto. This is to scale, this distance between them and their sizes. This is Charon. They orbit each other every 6.4 days, so about once a week. 
And what's really cool is that they're close enough in mass that they actually, that Charon doesn't really orbit Pluto like our moon orbits the Earth. They orbit a point somewhere in between, admittedly closer to Pluto, but still somewhere out in empty space. It'd be like two ends of a barbell or dumbbell with different masses on each end, and they would orbit like this. And, uh, and I think I have an animation later of, of that actually happening. Um, for Pluto is um, 1,186 kilometers in radius, double that for the diameter, and then Charon is about half that. It's about 600 or so kilometers in radius. So now I thought I'd take you on, uh, I'm going to exit PowerPoint, and I'm going to take you on a guided tour of Pluto and Charon. They are beautiful planets. I highly recommend it. Um, and to do that, I'm going to use some software developed partly for this mission um, at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory that you can get a public version of this. It's called Small Body Mapping Tool. And what it allows you to do is take pictures from anything and put it on any planet-shaped globe, and you can explore it. So here's, here's Pluto. And as we were approaching Pluto, we were seeing kind of this hemisphere of Pluto. And of course, as we're getting closer, Pluto's rotating underneath us. And its north pole is right around here. So it's in perpetual summer daylight near the North Pole, just like northern Alaska, same deal in the summer. And so as we're getting closer, our pictures are getting higher and higher resolution. And Pluto is rotating into view here. And this, right like this, is how Pluto is oriented as we flew past. Again, the North Pole is right about here. This whole area would be like the Arctic Circle, if you want to think of it like that. And as we got higher and higher resolution pictures of Pluto as we flew past, we were able to make a mosaic where the really high resolution stuff at about 400 meters per pixel. So that's like four football fields per pixel of the camera. You could see Central Park in New York City for, for comparison if you had 400 meter per pixel images of Earth. And uh, some of the first pictures that came back, oh, by the way, let me give you a little tour here just at this resolution. So this whole heart-shaped region, if you take the left ventricle of the heart, uh, this is a, we believe this is a giant glacier, not made of water ice like on Earth, but of solid frozen nitrogen. And we believe it's flowing. And some of the first evidence for that were from the really high resolution pictures that came down. And I'll zoom in here. And this is. Yeah. Oh. So what we have here is this craggy coastline, if you want to think of it like that. We've got some, uh, the Inuit word is nunatux, which is mountains poking through the ice. Nunatux here. And you can definitely see these lobes where ice has flowed around these high, uh, these mountains here. You can also see some of these flow patterns around here. Um, if we go to the south a little bit, OK, this round thing is an old impact crater. And here's its, the impact crater's rim. And the rim has been breached by here by the ice. And the ice has actually flowed into part of the crater and, and kind of ponded there. Um, we see similar things happen with glaciers on both Earth and Mars. Now, now one of the things that really caught our eye are these, these, these cells, these weird polygonal shapes uh, through here. And we've had a lot of discussion about what they are. Um, I think our first picture of them were actually in kind of the more central portions. I'm going to get rid of that bar. We're kind of more the central portions of the, of the glacier right around in here. And it's really subtle, really bland, but it's still, what in the world are these cracks here? Um, what's interesting about the cracks is that, that they've, got, they've got the central ridge that runs through them, and then there's two de low depressed lobes on either side. And that could give some clue as to how they're made. And so we're looking at these, we're looking at these right here. At this point, about three high-resolution pictures have been downloaded from the spacecraft. Spacecraft has the equivalent of like an 8 gigabyte flash memory stick on it for its memory. And two of those back up. And um, it was launched in, it was designed in 2000. So, you know, it's, yeah. 8 gigs is pretty good for a year 2000 flash stick, I think. So, so this picture was down on the room in, in our mission, mission control. It was the geology back room. Um, People are looking at this, and then um, a picture showing these mountains came down, except that it hadn't been fully downloaded yet. The top of the picture was still black. The image was still coming back from 3 billion miles away. And um, everyone else in the room was looking at that picture. I, wanted, I got on, I logged in, and I 
downloaded this partially downloaded picture. So just imagine the top of this is black, but I could still see this. And I'm like, hey guys, hey guys, there's mountains here. Guys, hey guys, hey people, there's mountains here. And everyone's ignoring me. They're still looking at that glacier. And I'm like, guys, there's mountains. Oh, look, Kirby, there's mountains. I'm like, I know. So um, that was. That was, that was really fun uh, to get to see that. And then everyone's like talking about the mountains now. I'm like, you're welcome. So um, there's this weird terrain down here that we have called elephant terrain, meaning we don't know what it is, but it looks like elephant skin. It's, it's, there's these fractures and some depressions and not sure what's going on with that, but uh, to be determined. Um, the white stuff is, is carbon monoxide snow. And probably these darker areas are places of the glacier that, for whatever reason, don't have um, snow accumulated. Now, uh, one of our science team members took this picture last winter out the hotel room, out his hotel window in, in Columbia, Maryland, when he was doing some work. And this is just a frozen pond. Yeah, yeah. But look at these cells, these convection cells in the ice. Look at some areas where there's some frost over here, and then it's darker with less frost. I'm not saying this is what's going on on Pluto, but it's, it's funny. It looks similar, doesn't it? Also, you know, this is much smaller than what's happening on Pluto. But, but it was funny. As we're looking at these pictures, he pulled up this picture he just happened to take last February or whatever and, and showed us that. So is the same thing going on on Pluto? Meh. I don't know. It's something to keep in mind. It's a hypothesis to test. Um, what we're starting to think is happening is that this glacier, which you can also see flowing down here, yeah, uh, you can really see where it's flowing a bit. These cells have gotten stretched out, it looks like, in the direction of flow if it's flowing to the south here. Um, what could be happening is that this solid nitrogen ice is scraping over the water ice, and the water ice is less dense than the nitrogen ice, so the water ice will literally float up through the, the nitrogen, and then it'll get carried to the distal or the end regions of the glacier and then get piled up here. It's like a lag deposit. It's like, it's like a snow plow in the winter piling up a snow pile and then it starts to melt, but all the dirt that was left over is, doesn't melt because it's dirt. And it's just dark and gross after that. But instead of being dark and gross, we have tall mountains that are 11,000 feet tall. That's, what the Rocky Mount, that's the size of the Rocky Mountains on Pluto, made out of water ice, not rock. Um, further over here to the west, this is a dark region that we've named Cthulhu. Um, it's dark from, with apologies to uh, Dr. Baldwin, some organic gunk. It's, <laughs> uh, okay, this is what happens if you take natural gas, like methane. You expose it to, you give it a sunburn, you expose it to ultraviolet light, and you let it kind of snow down onto the surface of the planet, and you end up with this really dark material adjacent to this really bright carbon monoxide snow. Don't breathe it. It's carbon monoxide. And, um, What's interesting is that it's filling in the bottom of these craters here, but as you go like here, right here, here, uh, this, is pr this dark area is probably higher. And the reason for that, we think, is that higher elevation, you've got lower atmospheric pressure. And with lower atmospheric pressure, that ice is going to evaporate or sublimate. And so the ice can only exist at lower atmospheric pressures, we think, and so that's where you get it. So it's the reverse of Earth. On Earth, Atmospheric pressure is not such a big deal, but temperature is. So that's why when you go up on mountains, it gets colder, and then you get snow. Opposites going on on Pluto. That took us all by surprise. We weren't smart enough to have thought of that at first. Um, this is just more of the coastline around the edge of the glacier there. Um, we have some lower resolution views. There's some canyons and cracks and large craters over here. This is only 5% of the images that were taken. 95% are still on that flash drive on, on the New Horizons spacecraft. And at download rates of 2 kilobits per second, those of you who remember the 90s and dial-up internet, that was 36 kilobits per second. That was fast. This is 2 on a good day. On a bad day, it's 1. And uh, so it takes a long time to get pictures back. So we're going to start our data downlink of photos again starting September 5th in a week or two. And that will continue for about a year to get everything back. As the spacecraft continues to hurtle out of the solar system, um, at 31,000 miles an hour, it's just going to be sending back data at less than dial-up speeds. <laughs> and so we're going to get a lot more high-resolution views of this whole area. We're going to get the same stuff back, but at um, uncompressed. It's not going to be JPEG compressed, if you know what that means. 
Um, we're going to get lots. Of, we're going to get a really great 70 meter per pixel strip all the way down here like this. Actually, it's going to cross the light and dark areas. That's going to be 70 meters per pixel compared to 400 meters per pixel. That's going to be super. So starting September again, every now and then online, check out this website, photojournal.jpl.nasa.gov. And once images are publicly released by NASA, about a week after they hit the ground, you'll have full access to all the data just like the science team does. And you'll be able to see the wonders of Pluto on your own computer or smartphone. Now, Pluto is only half the excitement in the Pluto system. Pluto also has this ginormous moon, Charon, that I mentioned. And here's, oops, not Charon. There's Charon. Tap the diameter. Here's the North Pole, and it's got this mysterious dark hood. Probably more organic gunk. But <laughs> I just do that to get a rise out of it. Yes, um, you got it. <laughs> we think that might be stuff that's transferred from Pluto to Charon. Because the funny thing is that Charon also orbits Pluto in the very outermost tenuous reaches of Pluto's atmosphere. So there's, there's some methane out there that's getting sunburned, it's getting photolyzed by UV light, and it's collecting on Charon. Now, we're not quite sure why it's collecting preferentially on the North Pole, but whatever, we'll figure that out maybe. Um, the, the, the names of places on Charon are kind of fun. The North Polar region is called Mordor. Um, different craters are named after Captain Kirk or Spock or Darth Vader. But one of the really interesting things about Charon is this canyon system that's running across the entire moon here. Not, there's some, definitely some tectonic forces going on in there, stretching the rock, which is ice, uh, giving really deep craters, or not craters, really deep canyons. Some of these canyons, um, if you look at a picture of Charon from the side, you can actually, if, if, the, if you can rotate this, um, if you can get an image where the, uh, the cliff is like on the side here, mm -hmm. it's called the limb, you can actually see through this canyon out the other side to space. These are deep. This would be great to base jump off of if you had a parachute in air. So, um, of course, there's, 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 there's lots of craters. Uh, it's interesting. This smooth area down here is mysteriously smooth, and this area up here is mysteriously more cracked up. Um, we're, this is, we got le much less data back so far of Charon. We're going to get a lot more data back from Charon again starting in September and going throughout the fall. Um, yeah, and, and, and these are hemispheres of of Charon and you saw on the Pluto model. This is just blurry data. We weren't up, this was facing away from the spacecraft and that's as good as it's ever going to get until we send another spacecraft there. And the dark regions on the bottom, don't know what's there. It's going to have to wait for another mission. That's in um, south polar winter darkness. So no chance of seeing that anytime soon. Is so, this spacecraft not coming back? It's not coming back. Oh. Nope. Almost none of our robotic spacecraft ever come back. It would take too much fuel and time, and with that fuel and time, you could go do more exploration. So why bring it back? So um, again, if you want to play around with this sort of thing, you can uh, download the small body mapping tool. It's kind of like Google Earth, but for anything besides Earth, you can do Earth too, but why? And you can download that right here at SBMT for small body mapping tool, jhuapl.edu. So getting back to other stuff. Um, Yeah. Any questions so far? Comments? We can keep this informal. Yeah, Dad. How do you know how that a mountain is eleven thousand feet tall from that photograph? That's a good. That's a good question. Um, you can do two ways. One, it, it casts a shadow. The, you can actually see the shadow, and if you know where the sun is in relation to the shadow, and you know where the spacecraft is looking, you can just measure the length of the shadow do some simple trigonometry and figure out the height of the mountain. There's another way to do it with a really fancy name called 2D photoclinometry, which uses calculus, Professor Carey. And uh, if you assume that the ground has all the same reflectance, then any variation in that reflectance is because it's tilted in different directions. And so you can get the slope, and then you integrate the slope to get what the mountain's actually doing. And from that, you can get the height of the mountain. And they both agree at about 11,000 feet for that mountain in question that I showed you earlier on Pluto. 11,000 feet, is that above the glacier, or is that above the? Uh, that's, above, that's above the glacier. Okay. Well, it's above wherever the shadow was shining. Okay. Yeah. And so does K 
Charon have a, a rock base to it, or is it just all ice? Yeah, that's a great question. Both Pluto and Charon have an icy shell along the outside. And based on their bulk density, which we know from their mass and their volume, um, you would have to have a rocky core to give you high enough density. But it's ice and maybe some liquids down deep, hundreds of kilometers to, to where you start to get to a rocky core. Yeah. Um, so then as the spacecraft passed Pluto, it turned around and took a picture of Pluto as illuminated from the backside by the sun. And what you see here is Pluto's air glow, its atmosphere above the surface. Pluto's atmosphere is about, what is it, about one millionth to one one hundred thousandth the density of Earth. You need a spacesuit or you'd pop. And it, so it's really tenuous. But it's enough to see it when it's backlit by the sun. Um, this is also why if you're driving in your car and your car burns oil, and you stop at a stoplight, you look behind you, the sun's setting, and so the sun's coming in through your rear view window, and then you see all the blue particles, smoke, oil smoke coming out of your exhaust pipe, it's being for, that's called forward scattering. You're seeing it because you're looking into the light. If you were the car behind you, you wouldn't see it as much because the sunlight would have to bounce off those little smoke particles and they come to you, and it doesn't want to do that. It's the same idea here. So Pluto needs to get its engine, engine seals fixed, but you can at least see the atmosphere uh, as it's being forward scattered from the, atmosphere, from, from the sun. Um, and then as it continued to traverse away from Pluto, that's Pluto's atmosphere. And that extends out to around 130 kilometers above uh, the surface of Pluto. That's about the same size as our atmosphere above Earth. Yes? This is informal. I'll just inform you that the car he's talking about was a Saturn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So it's a neutral atmosphere? Right, great question. So the atmosphere is predominantly nitrogen, just like our atmosphere. But there's also a fair bit of methane in the atmosphere. And so, but the methane can get turned into more complex things uh, as it gets photolyzed. And, and Dr. Kunzelman will be doing some demonstrations up here at the end of my talk to show what kind of chemistry goes on, on between Pluto and its atmosphere. Don't miss that. And so uh, the, the methane uh, gets sunburned, if you want to call it that, by ultraviolet light, gets photolyzed into more complex hydrocarbons. Eventually, they get too big to stay up in the atmosphere, and they settle down on the surface into a general gunk. And the word for that gunk is tholin, T-H-O-L-I-N. Carl Sagan coined the term in the 70s. This also occurs on uh, Saturn's moon Titan. It occurs on comets and other similar uh, objects out in the solar system. Um, as the spacecraft flew behind Pluto, as seen from the sun, uh, it did, did a couple experiments. One, it did a radio science experiment where Earth broadcast this powerful radio beam at Pluto. As the spacecraft went behind Pluto, that radio beam got blocked. But as it was going behind Pluto, it was starting to shine through portions of Pluto's atmosphere. And, they, and the radio science team could deduce uh, the pressure and the temperature at different altitudes above Pluto of what the atmosphere is doing. The same sort of thing also happened with what's called an ultraviolet spectrometer. It was looking at the sun, at the ultraviolet sun burning light coming from the sun. Uh, and as, it went, as the sun went behind Pluto, as seen from the spacecraft, it also took measurements of what's in the atmosphere. And it came up with, like, uh, you know, obviously nitrogen, methane, um, and some other uh, hydrocarbons, like benzene. And Dr. Baldwin can name the, rattle them off. Um, there's lots of them. Yeah. Um, good. Benzene's good. OK. Oh, yes, this stuff is toxic. Don't, don't lick it. Um, <coughs> Your tunnel gets stuck to the planet. Yeah. yeah. Now, now, Pluto also has, so in addition to Pluto's large moon, Charon, it's also got four little potato-shaped moons, um, two of which were imaged, well, all four were imaged by the spacecraft. We've got two of them back now. Uh, Nix is one, and Hydra is the other. These were discovered after the spacecraft launched uh, by teams using the Hubble Space Telescope. One of the guys who discovered it, uh, his office is down the hall from mine, so it was kind of fun to meet him. And uh, Pluto's small moon, Nix, is particularly near and dear to my heart because that's Nix. This is Hydra. And this is my cat, Nixie, Aww. named after Nix. She's, she's not happy in this picture, but she's, she's normally quite happy. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the actual uh, spacecraft itself. NASA headquarters. Uh, 
petitioned uh, the planetary science and the engineering community in the late 90s and early 2000s for proposals of spacecraft that could go to Pluto. And for the less money, the better. And so uh, a couple teams competed. The Johns Hopkins University, where, where I'm at, runs the Applied Physics Lab, which is mostly a Navy contractor, but also has about 15% of its portfolio dedicated to NASA, doing work for NASA as a contractor. So APL, the Applied Physics Lab, where I do my research, um, won the bid uh, for $700 million to build a spacecraft to go to Pluto. By the way, $700 million is the cost of two Joint Strike Fighter F-35 fighters, or it's enough for Social Security for 10 hours. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, in the big scheme of things, it's not a lot of money. Very affordable planetary exploration. Um, it was built in record time, five years from 2001 to 2006. Here's the spacecraft again. This is its plutonium power source sticking off the end of the spacecraft. It's so far from the sun, three billion miles away, that solar panel, that sunlight's too weak to use solar panels. And so we use the radioactive fuel that was named after Pluto, plutonium, to power the spacecraft. And uh, the, the plutonium pellets, I should have put a picture in, he in here, they can't help but be hot. They are always glowing red hot. And if you cool them off, they'll just heat up again. And it's that heat that uh, through the thermal electric effect will create an electric current that you can, about, it creates about 200 watts. So that's like a couple of these lights up here. Um, creates about 200 watts that you can drive the whole spacecraft off. So these are very low power science instruments and you, can, you can't turn them on, all on at the same time. Um, this spacecraft, oh, it's, it's fairly small, obviously a person for scale. It weighs half a ton and by, you know, it's like a subcompact car in weight. Um, most, a lot of spacecraft are much heavier than that. And it was launched on, at the time, the most powerful rocket in the world. The Atlas V rocket, with, with, which has optional five strap-on solid rocket boosters to give it an extra kick off the pad. Um, is there, is, I didn't think to ask about sound. Is there sound capability? Yeah. If I plug this in. Um, so what we did, we wanted to get to Pluto quickly. And by quickly, I mean less than 10 years. Um, we launched in January of 2006. We got there this past July. Yeah, nine and a half years to get to Pluto. We wanted to get there quickly. And so we made the lightest spacecraft, and we launched it on the most powerful rocket. So this rocket doesn't even know it has anything in it. We're basically launching this monster rocket empty to go, make it go really fast. This is where rocket science gets easy. The lighter your payload, the bigger the rocket, the faster it goes. And so just for comparison of how fast this launched, on the left uh, is something with no solid strap-on boosters. On the right is New Horizons launch. Watch how quickly it clears the tower. That thing's gone. This thing's still lumbering slowly off the pad. I'll play that one more time. This is New Horizons launch. It's an empty, it's an empty rocket, essentially, with five strap-on boosters. Here's no strap-on boosters and a heavy payload. And this thing just shoots off the pad. And that's how you get to, Jupiter, or to Pluto in less than 10 years. Um, the trajectory the spacecraft took, like I said, it launched in January of uh, 2006. I was a physics major at Houghton College at the time. I'd done two years here at Spring Arbor. I was at Houghton. Uh, I watched this live on NASA TV on my computer. Yes, we did have streaming internet video back in 2006. Oops. Um, I want to make a play. So we launched from Florida um, due east. As we're rounding over Africa, we light the rocket engine again to give us a kick out to the outer solar system. Now, going really fast wasn't enough. We wanted to shave even more time off. So in a few months, we crossed the orbit of Mars. Uh, and then we had to cross across the asteroid belt on our way to Jupiter. Now, Jupiter's got a lot of gravity. And even more importantly, it's got a lot of angular momentum around the sun. It's just hauling. And so we sped by Jupiter to pick up more speed and trim three years off the flight time. Going by Jupiter trimmed three years off the flight time, crossed Saturn's orbit, but Saturn was somewhere else in its orbit. This is to scale. Space is really big. <laughs> Crossed Uranus's orbit. Uranus was elsewhere in its orbit. And then almost exactly one year ago today, uh, we crossed Neptune's orbit. Actually, on August 24th, we, it was a year ago, we crossed Neptune's orbit on the way to Pluto. And as we bear down on the Pluto system, it got bigger and bigger in the windshield, which is shown here. Was there wind? No. Oh. I mean that metaphorically, Dr. Baldwin. <laughs> you can see the wobble of Pluto there. We sped past Pluto. This is based on real images you've already seen. 
And then we get to see the atmosphere backlit by the sun. And now we're just hauling out into the outer solar system. Um, this is one of five spacecraft that humanity has launched that is leaving the solar system never to return. It's beyond the escape velocity of the sun. The other four, Voyagers 1 and 2, which did the first grand tour of the planets in the 70s and 80s, and also Pioneers 10 and 11, which in the 70s explored Jupiter and Saturn for the first time. And together with New Horizons, those are the five spacecraft that are forever leaving the solar system. Um, let's see. Oh, what's next for New the New Horizons spacecraft is uh, a flyby of another Kuiper Belt object, Pluto and Charon, orbit the sun pretty close, pretty on the inner edge of the Kuiper Belt. But this extends out for another few billion miles. And uh, we've selected a target that we can get to with the remaining fuel on board. By the way, uh, uh, what is it, Dr. Trexler? Newton's first law, an object in motion stays in motion? Yeah, so Newton's first law says we don't have to keep the rocket engine on. We just coast. You know, once, once, once a rocket engine burns, we're good forever, basically, because we're an object in motion, and so we stay in motion. So we're just moving. Now, we have small rockets on board for course corrections, for spinning the spacecraft to stabilize it, or de-spinning it to take pictures. Um, and, uh, and so we've got enough hydrazine fuel on board to do a rocket engine burn that will put us on course for another Kuiper Belt object. It's Kuiper Belt object 2014 MU69. I hope it gets renamed. And uh, that's about a billion miles further from the sun than Pluto. So that's at 4 billion miles away. And we're going to fly past on January 1st, 2019, pending continued funding by NASA headquarters. But that's kind of a formality. I think it'll happen. So, um, so that's, the, that's the adventure of exploring of, of Pluto. But then there's also the human side to this whole thing of exploration. And I was very fortunate enough about two years ago to participate in um, kind of the first uh, Pluto science conference at the Applied Physics Lab in Maryland. We wanted to get all the world's experts on Pluto together to summarize the state of humanity's knowledge about Pluto before we actually got there. Now, the registration was about $200. I couldn't go, so I offered to be the flash drive gopher for people's PowerPoint presentations, if I could go for free. They agreed to this. And so I got to go to this conference and meet everybody and see everything going on. And I was running behind, you know, in the back a little bit, plugging in power, you know, flash drives. I thought that was it. All right, that was fun. Thanks for letting me do that. I find out that I'm still on these email lists. And people are starting to ask me to do things for the mission. And I keep talking to people. I see these people every day at work. So I pass them in the hall. Hi, Hal. How's it going? Hal Weaver. He's the project scientist for New Horizons. And I keep talking to these people that I run into. And before I know it, I'm getting invited to meetings. And they're giving me passwords to websites, to private websites, to get data. And before I know it, I'm on the mission. And I start volunteering to do stuff. And they give me more work. And this, this whole thing just keeps happening. So I schmoozed my way on the mission. <laughs> and it worked. Um, and I'm still on the mission. So if you're a student at Spring Arbor, talk to professors whose work interests you if you want to keep in going in that vein. Or wherever you are in life, if someone's above you doing something you like, just talk to them. Schmooze. Um, or in church, we say fellowship. Fellowship with them. <laughs> um, so as a result of that schmoozing, um, this is just what it looks like. Basically, mission control is a bunch of converted conference rooms with people's laptops open. Now, there is a real uh, mission operations center at, at APL where they actually send commands to the spacecraft. And it's lots more blinking lights and everything. Um, but most of what the science team was doing was just in converted uh, conference rooms around APL. So this is just us sitting around, looking at pictures, talking about stuff. This is uh, another one of converted conference rooms where all four science teams there were four science teams. I'm on the geology and geophysics imaging team for New Horizons. There's also a composition team that uses, mul that uses color imagery and spectroscopy to study the co surface composition and atmospheric composition. There's a particles and fields group. It's, um, it's space physicists who study the um, energetic particles and ions in the Pluto system. And then there's also the atmospheric team that uses um, mainly radio science, radio physics, to study probe Pluto's atmosphere. But I'm on the geology and geophysics imaging team, which means I get to look at the most pretty pictures. And so this is just what it looks like. It's just people sitting around conference rooms talking, basically. Yes? Earlier you said you saw that first video when you were a student at Colton. Was that because you were interested in Pluto or just because you were interested in space? 
uh, both. Uh, I was fascinated by Pluto. So um, I mentioned at the beginning I'm a member of the Planetary Society, which is not a professional organization. It's a grassroots for anyone interested in planetary exploration. For a student, membership is 37 bucks a year. And uh, your money uh, goes to help support political advocacy to help to encourage Congress people and the president to put the money forward to do this, to give NASA the money and the ability to go and do these sorts of things. Back in about 2000, this mission was in danger of being canceled. I was 14. I was a member of the Planetary Society. I called up my representative. I don't remember who they were. And I said, you've got to fund the Pluto mission. We've got to go to Pluto. And I sent in my $5 to the Planetary Society to help fund more political advocacy. So I was emotionally invested from an early age. I wanted this to happen because I, you know, my, my, my first book about space which was called, literally, my first book about space. In the Pluto section, it was a blurry blob. We don't know what it looks like. And I think it was colored blue, which is wrong. Mar or Pluto is the same color of Mars. It's red. And I wanted to see what Pluto looked like. And so this mission meant a lot to me. And so as a student at Houghton College, a physics major, um, I'm like, yes, we're finally going to Pluto. This is the rocket launch. I got to watch it. So. Pluto's been in the back of my mind for a while. Now, what's really fun when you work on a mission is that sometimes you get to meet celebrities. This is uh, Brian May. He's a lead guitarist for the rock band Queen. <laughs> By the way, he also has a PhD in astrophysics, I think from either Cambridge or Oxford. Um, he's a really nice guy. He's a rock. If you've ever heard, like, we will, we will rock you, stuff like that, that's him. Um, and so, and he's just. Just a really nice guy. He, he wanted to come and hang out with us. Our, the, the principal investigator of our mission, Alan Stern, invited him on, made him an honorary team member of the geology team. So he was with us two days. He got to see some of the images first along with us. And I got a picture taken with him. And that's not the NASA logo on my shirt, because that, that says nerd, not NASA. Um, and and this, is, this is kind of the day-to-day -day operations. This is just a converted conference room. There's computers everywhere that we can download all the data in real time. Here's Brian May. Here's me looking confused. Uh, <laughs> And there's lots of snacks. But here's Stuart. He's getting lots of here's peanuts. He's getting snacks. And uh, here's Simon, and he's he's doing some smart stuff, smart person stuff. So um, that's what it looks like to be on a mission. Now another cool thing, um, where are the audio? I want to make sure the audio is up for the next thing. Okay. The next cool thing is that Stephen Hawking uh, sent a special greeting to us, which is really fun. And so um, I'm gonna. I'm going to, it's a YouTube link here. I'll click on. And then I also have a transcript because he's a little hard to understand sometimes if, if you're familiar with how he talks. So, um. oops. Um, I, if you didn't understand that, no, I don't want to watch that. Um, I would like to congratulate the New Horizons team and NASA on their, pi on their pioneering decade-long mission to explore the Pluto system and the Kuiper Belt. Billions of miles from Earth, this little robotic spacecraft will show us the first glimpse of mysterious Pluto, the distant icy world on the very edge of our solar system. It is 50 years to the day and he's right, since the first successful mission to Mars, Mariner 4, which is the name of that spacecraft, sent back 21 images using a really bad black and white TV camera, <laughs> images of the red planet. Now the solar system will be further opened up to us, revealing the secrets of distant Pluto. The revelations of new horizons may help us to understand better how our solar system was formed. We explore because we are human and we want to know. I hope that Pluto will help us on that journey. I will be watching closely, and I hope you will too. So that was a lot of fun to get a personalized message from Stephen Hawking. Yes? So, so between 50 years 
when they sent out the Mariner 4 in this one, um, nobody wanted to fund any more planetary Oh, there have been tons of planetary missions been between there. It just happened that we happened to do this on a round year anniversary. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, there's literally dozens of spacecraft out in the solar system that have been launched pretty much continuously since we started. Yeah, that would be sad if that were the case, but uh, no. Um, sorry, my computer is acting funny. Oh, okay, well, that's the end of my prepared slides at this point. Um, and I want to invite Dr. Kunselman. Yes, and take questions. I want to take questions too. I'll take some questions. Yes, Jan. Um, the the uh, farmer who, who first discovered Pluto with his homemade telescope and, and uh, so self kind of self taught mm -hmm. that his ashes a vial of his ashes when the spaceship that's right out. a few grams of his cremated uh, ashes was, was there anything else that, of of kind of sentimental yeah. value that went out on the spaceship too? Yes, there were two sentimental items. One were Clyde Tombaugh's ashes. He was the American astronomer who discovered Pluto in 1930. Um, and actually he wasn't, I think he had a high school education at that point and his discovery actually helped fund his way to then go to university. So he kind of did things backwards but it worked. Um, and so he, he, in his will he actually requested that some of his ashes be put on the spacecraft. If a spacecraft ever went to Pluto he'd like to literally be on it. Um, the other piece is a stamp issued by the U.S. Postal Service uh, that was issued at the completion of Voyager 2's flyby of Neptune in 1989. And so there were a series of commemorative stamps for planets explored in the solar system. For Pluto, it said, Pluto, not yet explored. Pluto, not yet explored. And there is that stamp on the spacecraft that has been to Pluto, and Pluto has now have been explored. So that's... That's a good question. Thanks, Jan. Yeah? How close did the spacecraft come to Pluto? <sighs> Around 11,000 kilometers above the surface, I believe. It was, it was uh, if, you have, if you have Pluto and then the orbit of Charon around Pluto, Charon was over here, and the, the spacecraft went by around Charon's orbit, but on the opposite side of where Charon was at the time. Um, but the, uh, one of the cameras on board is a really long focal length camera that you can really, it's a zoom lens basically. And so it didn't matter that we were kind of far away, we could really zoom in and see stuff pretty close. Yeah, good question, yes? How long would the fuel last be able to transmit back? You said it's gonna take quite a number of months, if not years, to get all the data back. It's coasting, it's just flying, but uh -huh. they calculated that to take how long? So um, th we'll get the last of the data back in November of 2016. And um, we've got another flyby of another Kuiper Belt object planned for 2019. And so, that, so uh, this October, we're going to, September and October, there's going to be four engine burns to put the spacecraft on the correct trajectory to reach to that 2014 MU69. And um, probably only, a, that will take most of the rest of the fuel, which is several kilograms. There will be enough left for a little minor course corrections as you get there. The rest of the fuel is used to spin the spacecraft up for stability. Like a frisbee spinning is more stable, um, and you do that with the with the antenna with the dish pointed at Earth, so that you can send and receive instructions and data. And that is doesn't take any fuel to do that. So um, it, it has enough power, enough plutonium electrical power, uh, to keep taking data through the 2030s or 2040s. And in fact, it, there's probably not going to fly past any more objects, but we still want to study the effects of the sun, solar, wind, and these plasmas, and um, magnetic fields, and ions, and I think we even have a, a neutral charge, par uh, neutral, neutral particle detector on board um, that will help us characterize the, that part of the solar system. But the, the, the biggest limiting factor is money. Yeah? So you've got the liquid, well, it's not liquid, but you have the nitrogen glaciers, and then Mountains essentially made of liquid ice. Uh -huh. Solid ice, yeah, water ice. Is there evidence that the nitrogen uh, etches the ice mountains at all? No. In fact, uh, that probably doesn't happen at all. Nitrogen ice is fairly soft. It's okay. much softer than water ice. What we think might happen, though, is that the nitrogen ice would pluck chunks of water ice off the bottom. Nitrogen ice has a density of 0.99 uh, grams per cubic centimeter, and water ice is 0.9, I think. 
I think it's 0.9. And so that difference in density would then allow the water ice to, that solid state convection, which is kind of what's going on in my lava lamp that I didn't start soon enough, but the wax is less, it becomes less dense with heating. And so it will float up through the blue liquid, which I don't know what it is. But it's the same, but this is the convecting thing we think is going on in Pluto's nitrogen ice glacier, giving us these cells on the surface. By the way, no glaciers on Earth are seen to convect. So that's kind of interesting. Yes, Mr. Kuntzman. Is this your dream job, or what would it be if it's not? This is on the trajectory to my dream job. This is most of my dream job, yes. I want to be an astronaut, so that'd be even cooler. But short of that, this is, yeah, yeah. So this is, um, if that never happens, I'll be very content with this career. So yes, thank you. Kirby said the, the uh, Iceberg, the uh, the glacier, glacier uh -huh. is flowing away, or is flowing out. Where is it? Where is it? Some. You have any idea where where it's coming from? That it's coming from the middle. It's kind of like if you pour thick pancake batter under a griddle. You know how it just kind of like spreads out from the middle because it's too tall to support its own weight. It's the same idea. This is a giant nitrogen pancake, and so probably there's some sort of seasonal process, like when it becomes winter in that hemisphere. The ice may reaccumulate. There, there, there could be movement processes that would move the ice back elsewhere. And where it accumulates, then it can flow out from that point again. Yeah, that's a great question. More form it, out from somewhere or out from somewhere? Probably not, not a very good idea. We think it's a big source of the nitrogen atmosphere. This is a nitrogen ice glacier. Most of Pluto's atmosphere is nitrogen. It's probably a huge source of Pluto's atmosphere. And as Pluto retreats from the sun and it becomes winter, Pluto's orbit is very elliptical. Um, most, uh, most, if not all, of the atmosphere will condense and freeze onto the surface. And it could like recharge or resupply that glacier, for instance. And then when it gets close to the sun and warms up a little bit, then it could start to flow a little bit more. And I wonder what's underneath that. I'd love to know. It's probably more sludge. It could be. So some ideas of what could be underneath it. At the, at the pressures underneath a solid nitrogen ice glacier, you could have liquid nitrogen. You could have liquid other stuff because it's got pressure keeping it liquid from the weight of the overlying glacier. Uh, there's probably liquid methane, liquid nitrogen, probably not liquid water. Although geophysicists have showed that that is still maybe possible if it's really salty. At, at pressures from lithostatic pressure, could, you could still have liquid water. And there may still be enough heat inside Pluto to keep it liquid if you're deep. Yeah, Fred. High pressure will force water into a different type of ice. There's a lot of different types of water ices that uh, form at high pressures. Yeah, we're not sure what ice phases these are. I think on the surface they're probably normal ice. Um, and at the base of terrestrial glaciers, the pressure can melt it even. And so that's maybe happening on Pluto, giving liquid nitrogen. Um, we're still trying, we're all, all of us on the team, we didn't expect glaciers, and so there's no glaciologists on the team. And so we're all flipping back through like, oh, I remember when I took I remember studying glaciers when I was a freshman geology major and <laughs> go back to textbooks to try to find all these papers and try to <laughs> learn about glaciers right quick on the fly. Yeah. Can I follow up Beth's question about, you said you're interested in being an astronaut. And we haven't sent any astronauts anywhere except to the space station for a long time. Has there been any development of space suits? And what can you tell us about the future geological astronaut space suits? Yeah, so, um, uh, I've been privileged to know and work with the lead spacesuit engineer at the John NASA's Johnson Space Center. And they're currently working on the next generation of spacesuits that will eventually take humans back to the moon, where we haven't been since 1972, and to asteroids and moons of Mars and eventually Mars' surface. Um, and so I'm, I'm in close contact with her. Her dad's a former astronaut, and so she literally helped clothe him while he was in space. And, uh, and so they're developing, it's, the suit is called the Z2 spacesuit, and it looks pretty cool. And the idea is to be able to do field geology on the surface of another planet inside this suit. And so they're going to start doing a lot of testing this fall. Yeah, Miriam. Um, I'm wondering, as a Christian, what are some reflections that you've had about God throughout this process? I've had a number of those. Thanks for asking. Um, for one thing, I think my involvement on the mission is providential. Uh, I, um, I don't think it was just schmoozing that got me on there. Um, I'm remi I've been reminded of several scripture passages. One, there have been several passages um, that 
you know, God has prepared good works for us to do since before the creation of the cosmos or the creation of the universe. That includes Pluto. No eye has seen, no ear has conceived. And then what's on Pluto? That's not quite in the Bible, but um, it's pretty close. It's like for the past four and a half billion years, God's known what's happening on Pluto. And we've known since for six weeks what's happening on Pluto. Um, I've had those kinds of thoughts. There was another time um, we were, you know, we on the team, one of the things we need to do, it's not terribly scientific, but we need to name stuff. And um, so our, there was one day I was, I'm, I was on the bottom of the totem pole of the mission. So I was tasked with printing off this big, huge, long poster of, in this case, it was Charon. And we were going to just write names on it in, in Sharpies. We had a list of names. But we had to assign the names to a particular feature. And while that was going on, I'm like, we're naming stuff. <laughs> like, this is, this, is, this, is, this is what Genesis says that Adam was doing with animals. We're naming stuff. That's, like, that's part of the manifestation of us being formed in the image of God. We exercise that authority on the creation that's been entrusted to us as stewards. And so we're naming stuff on Pluto that we're exploring. And if you want to call it Darth Vader Crater, it's named Darth Vader Crater. And there is a Darth Vader Crater on Charon. Yeah, Chuck? Uh, in, the, in the Quran, God tells Adam the names of the animals. And in the wow. Bible, God has Adam name the animals. I think that gives. I think that's a reflection of the dignity that we have as humans, made in the image of God. Yes, we're fallen, but we're made in the image of God, and everything that God is, we are on a micro scale. And exploring what has been made, making things, inventing spaceships to go and do this is part of the Imago Day in us, I, I believe. Carol. Does Neptune have glaciers? No, we've only been to Neptune once on my fourth birthday in 1989 uh, with Voyager 2 spacecraft. And uh, Neptune is a giant planet. It's, it's hydrogen, helium, and methane. And as you go down through the atmosphere, it just gets denser and denser and denser until it would crush any human-made object. And then maybe down there, there's like a rocky core. But you can forget about going there just because the pressure is ridiculous. So Neptune used to be called the gas giant. And that's not quite accurate because there is a rocky core to it. It's not just gas all the way down. And most of the gas is in a liquid or solid phase. Um, now, Neptune's moons are very interesting. And I actually skipped a slide that I can show you now. Um, Neptune has an incredibly interesting moon called Triton. And one cool thing about Triton is that we don't think it formed uh, with Pluto. We think it's a captured Kuiper Belt object. Just, or it didn't form with Neptune. It's a captured Kuiper Belt object uh, that formed with, uh, that formed in the Kuiper Belt along with Pluto and then was captured. Here we go. Um, and one reason we think that is because it's orbiting in the wrong direction. Everything orbits in the same direction as the planet rotates, except Neptune is rotating like this and Triton's orbiting like that. And you can't get that if they're forming in the same place in space at the same time four and a half billion years ago. So this top picture is the surface of Triton. Um, the bottom picture is Pluto at the same resolution. This is about 400 meters per pixel. And we think these terrains may be similar. What's going on here to explain this is probably ice convection, like what's kind of going on in the lava lamp. We think some kind of convection based on the cellu cellular structure is also happening on Triton. And we also have fairly poor coverage of Triton surface. It was done with 1970s TV camera technology. This was done with fairly modern digital camera CCD technology. And so the differences in image quality are, are part of the problem in interpreting. But um, Triton is a fantastically interesting place in the solar system. It's one of my favorite planets. We need to go back. There's a lot of places in the solar system I want to go, and this is one of them. Um, so Triton is probably Neptune's most interesting moon, but there's also a few other small round moons of Neptune as well. So yes? Do you have any intention to be on a glacier before you do anything else? <laughs> um, it's funny you ask that. I, I've flown over glaciers on family vacations in Alaska, uh, but I'm like, oh, there's a glacier. OK, next. Now I'm more interested in glaciers. Um, uh, one of my friends is doing her PhD in glaciology at University of Buffalo. And we're, we want to, in the future, we want to be like grant writing buddies and do science together. And so, and like use Earth analogs as stand ins for stuff on Pluto. So I'm, you know, I'm, my friend Carrie and I may be going to a glacier and pretending it's Pluto or Mars sometime. Go to Mount Rainier. Okay, all right, thanks. Tom, did you want to come down? We can start setting up for some cool stuff. Folks, yeah, this, 
If you if you have somewhere to go or you want to take a break, you're, you're welcome to do that. If, if you'd like, I do have some demonstrations here. You don't have to stay for them. I just thought it might be fun to uh, sort of explore some of the temperatures and maybe some of the gases that might be found on Pluto. But, uh, you know, you're welcome to go if you need to. I'll wait about five minutes to get started. And if folks come back in after taking a break, we'll, uh, we'll do some experiments. Let's have a hand for Kirby. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.